well, you all know the formats well, and I cannot help but to take advantage of my position as the person with the mic to ask the first questions. <laughs> we have heard a quite an alarming forecast about the future. But we have also seen a person who has faced extremely unfavorable circumstances and overcome them. So in other words, we, how, what kind of person would be able to, in the face of adversity, retain his optimism? It reminds me of the words of the poem Invictus that Nelson Mandela constantly repeated to himself in his 20-something year in prison. I am the master of my fate, and I'm the captain of my soul. In short, the future is bleak only if we do nothing about it. I think here is a case where value research would recommend you understand the phenomena and public policy consists of changing the big atmosphere that would produce a future that is conducive to us all. What Ching Hai has given us, in my opinion, is under the status quo, the future doesn't look very good. For example, if we were to go into a massive investment in education, in research, what would happen is will come up with technological innovations that would increase our output tremendously and hence generate enough wealth for the next 20 generations. And what are the requirements to produce this burst in prosperity by driven by improvements in technology? It is, of course, the idea of excellence has to be pushed to its, I, in my case, moral level of being the ultimate judge of reward. And that is the guarantee, that is one way that we can get out of this. So my first question to Mr. Chia is, what are some of the things that policy makers should be thinking of in order to read. What are the big, some of the big changes? I'm sure you read 10 books in order to do that. For example, you talk about the political system being broken. What are the kind of things that needs to be put in place in order to fix that? Is it because the Wall Street control of the government has resulted in Main Street being taken advantage of. Now let's get back to something closer at home. Mr. Chia makes his money in Hong Kong. I'd like to hear about the future of Hong Kong now that Shanghai is rising on the horizon. And it is now gone beyond B shares because the Roman B could very well be an international vehicle currency. So I think these are positive developments and I'd like you to tell us what you think about the future of the world is going to look like as Shanghai emerges, as the Roman B emerges, and what could the government do around the world to adjust to this phenomenon? Hong Kong is a strange place, even though I lived there for so long, because the people are not as uh, Chinese as you might think. They have a hybrid. You know, they, they have their own way. Yeah. But essentially, uh, the simple way to answer the question that you so rightly raised is that so long as Taiwan's issue is not settled, Hong Kong will be okay. Because the Beijing government doesn't want to make Hong Kong into a mess because you'll frighten the uh, people in Taiwan and they may be even more resistant to the idea of uh, one country. So I think Hong Kong is being sheltered partly by this kind of uh, 
in a way, it's almost like blackmail. Yeah. Uh, but Beijing needs to settle the Taiwan issue and uh, reunite Taiwan with China. And then they will turn to the issue of Hong Kong. Uh, I personally have uh, less and less sympathy for some of the things I see in Hong Kong because I think it's behavior of a very spoiled people who uh, got their freedom given to them on the plate by the joint declaration. But I think freedom is something you have to win, you have to fight for, and you have to appreciate. And there's a price for freedom that you have to pay as well. But I see very little understanding of it in Hong Kong. People are always demonstrating, shouting, and protesting. But uh, no one seems to realize that they already have more liberty than the average person in the United States. But when it comes to very basic things like for example, there's a mass public resistance against something called Article 23, which actually is an obligation, part of the joint declaration of Hong Kong that they had to sign. Article 23 simply says that they must be uh, some sort of uh, love the country uh, classes in school. You know? Like we have in Malaysia, we sing the national anthem and uh, pay respect to the national flag. The Hong Kong people won't, don't want it and won't have it. Yeah. So I think that is uh, quite unrealistic, actually. I think the very long-term future of Hong Kong is not good, but the medium, the short term is actually excellent. And on the other hand, because I have so many friends living in Shanghai and uh, working there, I think the mid short term future of Shanghai is actually not very bright because they still don't have enough rule of law and they still don't have a convertible currency. They're going to move to semi convertibility And uh, surprisingly, Shanghai also uh, has a labor force that is uh, more socialist than I had expected. There's still a bit of a state-owned enterprise mentality. Shanghai has a long way to go before it can really threaten Hong Kong. But in the very long run, I think Hong Kong may have a problem. It's a very complicated way of answering a simple question. Sorry about that. No, no. Well, next, we don't have much time left. The gentleman at the back, will be the first. You had asked a question before. So, uh, so we other people have a chance. You, sir? Oh, sorry, um, it, my questions just now weren't answered. Uh, please sit yeah. down, sir. We'll come get you. Number two. Please begin, sir. Hello, uh, Mr. Chia. My, my name is Goe, also born in the year of horse. Uh, so my question is, for value investing, I know sometimes you buy and hold, and sometimes never sell. But certain uh, times uh, when you buy a stock, the price just drop. Maybe because the company announces a very bad result or have some bad news. Or during the global financial crisis like 97 and 08, the price just drop. Even a good company also drop. So my question is, do you have cut loss strategy? If you have, what is the criteria for cut loss? Thank you. Okay, sir. Mr. Yellow Shirt, <laughs> wake up please. Sorry about that. You cannot be a good investor if you are not alert. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Chia, I would like to ask you more on a personal question. Um, it's actually regarding wealth distribution to your children. Um, <laughs> I, 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 are you more like Warren Buffett who leaves behind virtually 99.9% of his wealth to the charity? Or are you more like an Asian who prefers to leave it to their, to their children? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. the cut loss thing, I don't have a cut loss strategy. I have a cut mistake strategy. Uh, about one third of everything I do, even going back to the early days and to now, the ratio has not improved. We are making about one third error rate, usually based on wrong analysis of human being who disappointed us. Typically, through various tests, we found the human being was actually lying to us. He's a liar, you know? Uh, we will cut the, the position, regardless of whether we're making money or losing money. It's also important for you to understand that people like me have no interest in what is my entry price, except for, of course, a per commercial purpose of performance measurement. I find that being too fixated on what is your cost become an ego game where you don't want to take loss because you think if you lose, it, it, it implies you're not a good investor, that kind of stuff. That is not important to me. Yeah. I'm very interested in making, finding the mistake and getting out very fast. If, it, if I believe, on, on the contrary, that I make the right decision, 
if the stock drop and if I can afford it, I will simply keep buying more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we have we first bought huge amounts of gold in uh, 2000, the year 2000. That was a courageous decision because we are running a China fund, and gold is called a no hero investment for us because if you get it right, nobody will thank you. If you get, if you get it wrong, you'll be blamed by both your clients and the media. Why are you putting a fund that is a China fund into the yellow metal? But I'm that kind of guy. If I believe I make the right decision, I'll do it. So we put up to uh, five to ten percent of our fund in gold, and we make a lot of money because gold was only like four hundred, three hundred fifty dollars an ounce at that time. Today is about one thousand three hundred and sixty-five dollars an ounce as of this morning. You know, so right decision buy more if it drops. Wrong decision cut it, regardless of your entry. The other gentleman's question is about uh, the children, etc. No, I don't believe in donating my money except in small amounts, yeah, because I come from a different generation. We were very poor. We, to some extent, we almost starved. You, know? you can really, in Malaysia, believe it or not, you can end up not having enough food to eat. That's what happened to me. I have no intention of leaving my money to anyone except my children, except in small amounts, which I'm, I'm the go-to guy, for example, in uh, Penang for various uh, charitable donations, but these are all small amounts that are not very big to me. My children, when they reach adulthood, may choose to donate money the way Warren Buffett says he's doing. That's their decision. But for me, I very much intend to keep what I have. That's a very frank answer to you. Thank you. Uh, sir? You. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chia. Thank you to Penang and Steel for inviting you here. I think it's fantastic, to, uh, especially you sharing your experience with her. My name is Chan Fai Kiong. I'm retired. Uh, okay, since your funds uh, invest all over the world, I think for me personally, I'll be very interested about your investment in the Malaysian market. If yes, you invest, what are the positives you see? And if no, then what are the negatives or, you know, what uh, improvements you need to see in the Malaysian market, which then will interest you all to actually invest in the Malaysian market. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, we have consistently had a very long position in the palm oil sector of uh, Malaysia. Uh, because we think that palm oil is where Malaysia, Indonesia has genuine global competitive advantage. So uh, in recent years, we have moved more to Indonesian plantation stocks like Bumitama, Golden Agri, etc. But in earlier years, we invested in like uh, KLK, which we still have. Uh, at one point, we even was a cornerstone investor for the IPO of Felder last year. We took about 5% of the entire company. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we are very cautious right now on Malaysia, in general. Uh, Malaysia, as you can see from the exhibit, uh, the uh, country's debt is very high because of too many years of uh, election promises financed by throwing money at the people. We just don't like that kind of uh, bad discipline. The result today is that uh, Malaysia's debt, both at the government and household level, is among the highest in Asia. For example, it's significantly higher than Indonesia or uh, China or Thailand. You know? This is not a good sign. Now, another problem with this debt that I want to tell you about is that about half the government bonds issued by the government of Malaysia are held by foreign investors. We hate that because foreign investors are always the first to cut and run if they smell trouble. It's not stable. Unlike, to give another example, the case of uh, People's Republic of China, where their debts are almost entirely financed by domestic market. So they're much safer. In the worst case scenario, impose capital control, you only owe your own people, right? Then you're, you're relatively safer. Here's another exhibit, yeah. Uh, to my own surprise, the country has become a net importer of oil. And I think all of us in this room can appreciate how important oil is to Malaysian government revenues. Petronas and oil revenues in general finance many of the social and political programs of the country. But now Malaysia actually on a net basis buy more oil than uh, itself to the rest of the world. 
the other issue I have in Malaysia, uh, and we speak frankly, you know, we, we do face our problems in a frank manner, is that uh, the average uh, workforce in Malaysia no longer is as productive as it used to be. Uh, these figures are not invented by me. I mean, they all come from reputable uh, international institutions. Uh, for a variety of reasons, total factor uh, productivity in Malaysia has actually declined, even compared to uh, neighboring countries such as Thailand or the Philippines. And uh, some people say this is a classic middle income trap where we bump the ceiling now in terms of the potential or what we can do. Other people will blame the brain drain where talent from Malaysia keeps getting exported, especially to Singapore. Uh, the Singaporeans are laughing all the way, actually. But we do have a problem here, and uh, it explains why Value Partners as a firm has not been particularly bullish on Malaysia. But we recognize that in certain sectors, I mentioned Palm oil, for example, it's still a good place. Not bullish on Malaysia because there's too much bullshit around. <laughs> so, second question, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, my, my question is related to gold investment. Uh, as you stated just now, I mean, it's like 5 to 10% of your portfolio is in uh, gold. And uh, coming from an asset equity-based management company, I mean, it's like there's quite a pessimistic stand that you are actually taking. In November last year, you actually noted that gold investment is the way to go since uh, the U.S. debt has risen for the past 20 years. Given that Bernanke and his team has, have recently hinted that they are going to uh, be tapering off QE, uh, do you still advocate on the notion of gold investment at this juncture? Yeah. Uh, the short answer is yes, but it's a professional risk for me because as I keep saying, gold is a no-hero investment for us. <laughs> if we get it wrong, the clients will kill us and the media too. You know? uh, but I'm holding on. Uh, earlier this year, because of the uh, appreciation in price of gold, for many of the funds, including our main fund, the Classic, the uh, percentage of gold increased to 10% from originally 5% because we doubled our money. So I trimmed back to 5%. So we took profit on gold just in time before this year's very sharp setback in gold prices. Uh, but we'll keep it at 5%. It's a kind of a inner reserve of the uh, fund. Uh, I think the normal public should appreciate that gold is a very treacherous investment. I speak as someone who has gone through thick and thin with gold and had gone through some very awful nightmares. The intra-year volatility of gold in the last 10 years, average is 20%. What does it mean? Within the same calendar year, the price of gold, on average, has fluctuated 20% between its high and low points. There are so many anecdotes of people who bought at the high point and sold at the low point within the same year. And these people uh, will lose about up to 20% a year on gold even though within the last 10 years, the price of gold has appreciated so strongly. So I am not sure whether we should be advocating gold investment to the general public, who probably find emotionally too much of a roller coaster. But in the context of a $9 billion fund, 5% is quote-unquote only about $450 million US dollars. We can afford to take the rough with the smooth. Yeah. But you have to be a big player to get involved in this kind of a treacherous uh, investment. By the way, uh, if you go to Google and type in Value Partners Hong Kong or Chia Cheng Hai, you will see a lot of uh, information on our company. It's a, it's a, it's a lot, a lot of, pretty much what I've been telling you this afternoon. Thank you. The time is now five o'clock. I think we have had a great session in celebration of Penang and its proud son. I'm very pleased that Mr. Chia has come back and given us an exceedingly frank assessment, not only of himself, but of the country as well. His remarks at the end about the state of public finance in Malaysia and of the possible disastrous balance sheet of Petronas brings 
I would say should certainly give us cause to be concerned. But as I have said, we face the future with optimism because we in Penang have learned that ultimately we must strive to be the master of our fate and the captain of our soul. And let us thank Mr. Chia for giving us this message so strongly. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming today. We hope you've gained much insight from our lecture. We hope to see you at the next event organized by Penang Institute. Have a pleasant day ahead.